One of the greatest mysteries of humanity is that of the birth of our universe, and modern science is on the brink of solving this mystery. At the International Scientific Center Joint Institute for Nuclear Research in Dubna, about 100 kilometers north of Moscow, by the efforts of 26 countries, an enormous, unique physical facility is being built. It is called the Superconducting Collider Nika. This facility will enable matter, which we are all made of, to be studied in a lab in its extreme states, the very states it was at the earliest stage of the emergence of our universe. Since ancient times, people have admired the starry sky, made wishes under the stars, declared their love to each other, lived and died. The most inquisitive minds try to perceive how many stars shine up there, how far they are from us. Then they invented the telescope to see the stars better. People were looking for constellations in the sky and gave them beautiful names. The stars guided travelers and were essential in making horoscopes. I think many of you looking at thousands and thousands of stars in the night sky have asked yourselves questions like, where did it all come from? How does our universe work? Scientists have also been looking at the starry sky. They have high-powered telescopes at their disposal and can see hundreds of billions of galaxies and star clusters and know that each of the galaxies contains hundreds of billions of stars. They observe old stars exploding and new stars being born and see that everything in the universe is in constant motion. And of course, scientists are preoccupied with the same questions. What do stars and planets consist of? What are black holes and quasars? What is dark matter and dark energy? They are trying to figure out how our world was formed, how old it is, and what its dimensions in space are. What are we made of? And what is all around us? What are the elementary bricks of matter? Why are we the way we are? How was the universe born? How did it evolve? How were the stars and galaxies that surround us formed? How are we and the universe going to evolve? Science can answer all these questions. Fundamental science is essential for an educated, highly developed society. It is the level of fundamental science that serves as the indicator of how well a society is developed. Fundamental science produces important results for humankind. It is most valued for the new knowledge it gives. We obtain new knowledge when we explore the world around us, when we conduct various experiments, and when we try to reach and learn something new. If there is a goal to reach, it is in human nature to reach it at any cost, be it the summit of Everest, the South, or the North Pole. To achieve this, we need to develop technology. And by now, over just several hundreds of years of active scientific research, we have tamed electric and nuclear energy. We use the internet, mobile communications, GPS devices, we fly into space, we go miles deep in the ocean. And all these technologies, all these new possibilities, have been obtained thanks to fundamental research. The 20th century is undoubtedly the age of physics. The development of physics over the 20th century has completely changed the quality of life on our planet. This includes nuclear power and lasers, space traveling to other planets of the solar system, radio, television, internet, smartphones, and tablet PCs. Can you imagine your life without all of this? It seems to me you can't. But this is only one way to look at the achievements of modern science. 
one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is the formation of a modern worldview. For the first time in the history of humanity, it became possible to combine the physics of microcosm and the physics of macrocosm, to find the elementary bricks of matter, quarks, electrons, neutrinos, and to start studying how these tiny particles, being billions of billions of times less than a meter, formed our immense universe. The modern understanding of space, time, and the universe can be dated back to 1916, the creation of the theory of general relativity by Albert Einstein. In 1922, the Russian scientist Alexander Friedman developed Einstein's theory further and suggested a hypothesis stating that our universe is expanding. This hypothesis was followed by an important conclusion that at the very beginning, all matter of the universe was concentrated in a small volume from which the expansion began. This expansion could be caused by an explosion. The next step, comparable to the contribution of Copernicus, was made by the American astronomer Edwin Hubble, who in the 1920s worked using the largest telescope of the time. Not only did he discover many other galaxies beyond our galaxy called the Milky Way, but he also found out that the greater the distance between the galaxies was, the faster they moved away from each other. Thus, he experimentally proved that the universe was expanding. In 1948, the Russian theoretical physicist George Gamow assumed that if the universe had originated as a result of an explosion of hot, dense matter, then somewhere in space, there must have remained traces of that event. In 1964, the American radio astronomers Arno Penciaz and Robert Wilson discovered radiation currently known as the relic background. The temperature of this radiation is now 3 degrees K as predicted by Gamow. Modern science believes that the universe was formed 13.7 billion years ago as a result of an event that is now called the Big Bang. That is, scientists figured out that the universe had a beginning. Now, they have to answer another important question. How exactly was the universe born? What bricks of matter does it consist of? What do we know so far about the world around us and the structure of matter? Everything that surrounds us on the planet Earth, we ourselves and all living things, is made of tiny particles, atoms. The word atom in Greek means indivisible. However, modern science knows that atoms consist of an atomic nucleus and electrons. The size of the atom is very small, about 10 to the negative 10th power meters, and the size of the atomic nucleus is 10,000 times smaller than that. The atomic nucleus consists of protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons, in turn, are also divisible. They consist of quarks and gluons. Despite the fact that quarks and gluons are called the bricks of matter, no one has ever observed them in a free state. As the distance between quarks increases, the restraining forces become so great that quarks cannot leave the proton or neutron. But it has not always been the case. In the early universe, there existed such high temperatures and matter densities that quarks and gluons manifested a special state of matter called quark-gluon plasma. What happened in the first moments of the birth of the universe? How were protons, neutrons, and atoms formed out of quarks and gluons? Modern physics is looking for the answers to these questions. So what do we know about the history of our universe? About the history of the world around us? At the moment, according to modern scientists, 
we know that the universe was formed 13.7 billion years ago. It happened as a result of the Big Bang. The Big Bang was a phenomenon that occurred at unimaginably small distances, 10 to the negative 33rd centimeters, within very short periods of time, 10 to the negative 44th seconds. And the density of matter that was formed as a result of the Big Bang, that is, the density of the earliest universe, was equivalent to 10 to the 94th grams per centimeter cubed. In a very short period of time, approximately 10 to the negative 34th seconds, the universe, as a result of inflation, that is, a very rapid exponential expansion, the universe expanded to about 10 centimeters. Thus, as the result of the Big Bang, when the inflation was over, Several types of elementary particles, elementary bricks of matter, were formed in the universe. Quarks and gluons, electrons and gamma rays or photons, and neutrinos. And at that very moment, in about one millionth of a second after the Big Bang, Quarks and gluons, interacting with each other at colossal temperatures and densities that surrounded them, formed quark-gluon matter. Later, while the universe was expanding and cooling, protons and neutrons began to form. Quarks, according to some laws we are currently unaware of, were grouped into pairs and triplets, forming protons, neutrons, and mesons. In approximately three minutes after the Big Bang, the universe consisted of protons, neutrons, electrons, gamma rays or photons, energy carriers, neutrinos, and other elementary particles and carriers of interaction. And the temperature of the universe was so high that in thermonuclear reactions, light elements such as hydrogen, helium, and lithium could emerge. With further decreasing temperature, the nuclei of the lightest elements captured electrons to their shells and formed the first neutral atoms. And from that moment, about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, the so-called relic photons were formed. These were energy carriers, gamma rays that no longer interacted with protons, neutrons, or electrons. Ever since, these relic photons have been traveling in the universe, and they are now helping us recreate the picture of the universe's evolution after that moment. In fact, photons of the relic radiation have witnessed all the events in the universe that have occurred since 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And observing them, studying these particles with telescopes and other astronomical instruments, we can reliably speak about the history and the evolution of the universe since 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And in order to observe and thoroughly study and be sure of what was happening at the earliest stages of the universe's evolution, we need a time machine. An accelerator can serve as one, because with the help of an accelerator, this absolutely wonderful device invented by humankind, it is possible to create extreme temperatures and densities in the lab. We know that a substance can be in different states. For example, water can be in a solid, liquid, or gaseous state. Heating or cooling a liquid, you can get solid matter, ice, or gaseous matter, steam. The transition of matter from one state to another is called a phase transition. In order for a phase transition to occur, it is necessary to change the temperature of a substance, its internal energy. But under these transformations, water molecules themselves do not change. From the school course of physics, you know that the boiling point of water, that is the temperature of the phase transition, depends on pressure. For example, the water in a pot on the mountaintop will boil at a temperature lower than 100 degrees Celsius. The dependence of the state of matter on pressure and temperature 
is usually illustrated by graphs called phase diagrams. The phase diagram of water shows that at the atmospheric pressure typical at the surface of the Earth, we can first melt the ice and turn it into a liquid, and then heat the liquid to its boiling point and turn it into steam. However, on Mars, ice will not melt with rising temperature, but immediately turn into steam. In addition to the gaseous, liquid, and solid state of matter, there is one more state, plasma. The ordinary substance consists of atoms and molecules. High pressures and temperatures destroy molecules, and atoms lose external electrons. This produces plasma consisting of negatively charged electrons and positively charged atomic nuclei. For example, our sun is a substance in a state of plasma. At even higher pressures and temperatures that existed in the early universe, quarks and gluons of which protons and neutrons now consist were in a state that is commonly called quark-gluon plasma. At present, quark-gluon plasma may exist in the center of neutron stars and black holes. The process that results in formation of protons and neutrons from quarks and gluons, as well as the process of transition of protons and neutrons back to quark-gluon plasma, is called a phase transition. Scientists believe that the conditions necessary for the creation of quark-gluon plasma can be reached by colliding nuclei moving with a speed close to the speed of light and possessing energies of tens and hundreds of billions of electron volts. In order to obtain such nuclear collisions, unique physical setups, colliders, are constructed. In the early universe, there existed extremely high temperatures, energies, and densities of matter. Temperatures much higher than those in the core of the Sun or other giant stars. And densities much higher than the densities of neutron stars, unique, absolutely amazing objects of our universe. These are compact objects a few kilometers in size, with masses comparable to the mass of the solar system. And in order to simulate the conditions that existed in the early universe, in order to study the early universe, we need, in a very small volume, for a very short period of time, to recreate the conditions in which matter will exist at very high temperatures and densities. With the help of a charged particle accelerator, we can create extreme temperatures and densities of nuclear matter, thus modeling the state of the early universe. There are several huge accelerator complexes in the world, collider complexes, where bunches of charged particles are collided and extreme states of nuclear matter are investigated. The Large Hadron Collider is a one-of-a-kind facility in the International European Center for Nuclear Research, CERN. This collider allows accelerating particles, such as protons or heavy nuclei, up to an energy of 14 trillion electron volts. Such colossal energies, together with high temperatures, let us study the processes that occurred at the earliest stages of our universe's formation. In the experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, the Higgs boson was discovered. It is a particle responsible for the mass in the elementary particles. The Rick Collider at the Brookhaven National Laboratory is a unique superconducting collider with a perimeter of four kilometers, a facility that allows colliding beams of heavy nuclei, for example, gold nuclei, with a total energy of 200 billion electron volts. In these collisions, it is possible to reach such a temperature of colliding particles that protons and neutrons actually melt, and scientists can investigate the liquid of free quarks and gluons. However, at these temperatures, phase transitions occur very rapidly, and we can observe either nuclear matter in the usual state or a quark-gluon liquid, 
quark gluon plasma, a phase state of nuclear matter, when quarks and gluons can be observed in a free state. But it is even more interesting to observe a mixed phase of nuclear matter. Studying phase transitions, investigating the mixed phase state of nuclear matter, quark gluon plasma, is tremendously important to understanding the processes that occurred at the earliest stages of the emergence of the universe. And according to modern scientists ideas, in addition to relatively high temperatures, immense densities of nuclear matter are required. In other words, it is necessary to create conditions that allow us to reach colossal densities of nuclear matter to be able to observe these phase transitions, to investigate the mixed phase of nuclear matter and quark-gluon matter thoroughly in detail. The optimal energy range in which we expect to obtain the maximum density of nuclear matter is around 10 billion electron volts. And it is in this energy range that the future Nika Collider, currently being built in Dubna, will operate. Let us spend a few minutes dwelling upon how accelerators and colliders work. Suppose that we want to increase the energy and velocity of a charged particle, for example a proton. To do this, we place a proton between positively and negatively charged electrodes. When a proton with a charge of 1 volt passes through, its energy increases by 1 electron volt. If you put electrodes in a closed volume from which the air has been pumped out, between these electrodes, one can create a voltage of hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of volts. But to create a voltage of 1 million volts, and what's more, 1 billion volts, will not be possible. To do this, we need more complex devices called accelerators. Usually, we deal with circular accelerators, where a charged particle that repeatedly passes a relatively small potential difference acquires enormous energy. The accelerator part, in which an electric field is generated to increase the energy of a particle, is called the accelerator section. Every time when a bunch of particles passes through the accelerator section, the electric field boosts them, giving them extra energy. To keep a charged particle in a circular orbit inside the accelerator ring, dipole magnets are used. The magnetic field inside a dipole magnet changes the direction of the charged particle motion, and instead of a straight line in the accelerator, it is possible to make charged particles move in a circle. The accelerator ring has a fixed radius. In the process of acceleration, the momentum of a charged particle also increases with increasing energy. Therefore, in order to keep a particle in the orbit with a fixed radius at a simultaneous increase in the particle energy, we should increase the magnetic field as well. Since charged particles are accelerated in bunches, individual particles tend to spread out due to electric repulsion. To prevent this, particle beams need to be focused all the time. Such focusing is made by special devices called magnetic lenses. A magnetic lens can focus a beam in the vertical plane while defocusing it in the horizontal one and vice versa. Therefore, in order to focus the beam both vertically and horizontally, it is required to use a combination of two magnetic lenses. In the accelerator, charged particle beams are divided into separate bunches that follow one another at a strictly defined distance. This is the way charged particles are accelerated in the accelerator sections. When particles are flying through, the electric field in the acceleration section is not maximized but it is increasing. If a particle turns out to be more energetic than its neighbors, it shoots ahead and in the next circle, it comes to the accelerating chamber in advance. Because of this, it gets slightly less extra energy than the rest of the particles, and vice versa. If a charged particle accidentally loses some energy and stays at the back of the bunch, when flying through the accelerator section, it will receive a little more energy than the rest. This method of particle acceleration is called phase stability principle. 
It was developed in 1944 by academician Vladimir Wechsler. Thanks to the phase stability principle method, the accelerator section itself maintains the shape of bunches, preventing them from spreading longitudinally. It is this discovery that has made creation of modern accelerators possible. In order to use the energy of accelerated particles to the maximum, they are divided into two beams moving in opposite directions. When the particles meet, they collide head-on, and at the point of their collision, all the energy accumulated during acceleration is released. In a collider at the points where beams meet, we record the events that occur as a result of a collision. An outstanding contribution to the development of colliders was made by academician Giersch Budker. He proposed the method of electron cooling on which collider operation is based, and in the period from 1964 to 1967, he built a collider in Akadem Garodok, academic town of Novosibirsk, where he conducted the first experiments on colliding beams. Let us have a look at how Nika works. The process of preparing a beam for the experiment starts in a device called the heavy ion source. It is a superconducting solenoid with a field of six tesla, in which atoms of gold sputtered onto a tungsten wire evaporate at a temperature of about 1000 degrees and afterwards are ionized by an electron beam, picked up and accelerated to a certain energy to be transferred to the linear accelerator. In the linear accelerator, by means of the beam transport and focusing system, heavy ions are accelerated to about 3 million electron volts and transferred further along the transport channel to the first cascade of accelerators called the booster. The booster is a superconducting ring with a perimeter of 211 meters, in which a beam is prepared for the experiment for about two seconds and then transferred to the following Nika cascade. In the process of acceleration, the beam or the bunch of ions acquires an energy of approximately 500 million electron volts, cooling to the required size. When we talk about beam cooling, we do not mean energy decrease or deceleration, we mean bringing the cross and longitudinal dimensions of the beam to the minimum parameters, those required by the experiment. After accelerating in the booster, the bunch is transferred to the next ring called the nucleotron. The nucleotron is a superconducting accelerator. By the way, it was one of the first superconducting accelerators of heavy ions in Europe, and it was launched here in Dubna using our technologies. In the nucleotron, the bunch is accelerated to several billion electron volts, and afterwards, the prepared bunch with an energy of several billion electron volts gets into one of the collider rings. The entire procedure of bunch preparation takes about four seconds. We need to make several, as we call them, injections of bunches into the first and the second collider ring. In total, there are about 50 injections or procedures of preparation and acceleration of bunches for the experiment, and the whole process takes about four to five minutes. After we have filled the collider with the right amount of gold ions, the so-called beam gymnastics begins in the collider. Gymnastics means that we should prepare a beam for the experiment within a very short period of time if we want to have the maximum number of useful events at the point where the beams meet and interact. And this is how the statistics and effectiveness of the experiment are estimated. We need to squeeze the beams to the minimum size so that they could have the maximum ion density in the bunch. Only in this case will we reach the necessary density of nuclear matter and the necessary results that we expect from the experiment. The dimensions of bunches characteristic of the experiment are as follows. Bunch length, about 60 centimeters, and cross dimensions, about 1 millimeter, vertical and horizontal. And now the beams collide in a specially prepared section called the meeting section or beam interaction point. And it is at this point that the main device, 
the main experimental detector of the entire accelerator complex, is located. In our case, this detector is called MPD, which stands for Multi-Purpose Detector, or Detector for Searching and Studying the Mixed Phase of Nuclear Matter. The detector is an enormous cylinder. If you imagine a fuselage of a large, long-haul aircraft, for example, Boeing Jumbo, then you will get the idea of the real size of the detector. The length of this cylinder is about 10 meters, and its diameter is about 7.5 meters. And it is inside this detector, in the very center, that the collision of two bunches or beams occur, and billions of particles born in gold-ion collisions fly in all directions. Therefore, the main technological or engineering task of our complex is that at the right time and at the right place, we must collide bunches of heavy particles of immense intensity. And the main physics task, the main scientific task, is that from one billion interactions that the detector will register, we must find and distinguish those very rare events, those particles that will indicate that a phase transition has taken place in the observed system, or a mixed phase state of nuclear matter manifested itself. And thus, we will be able to state that in our experiment at the Nika Collider, we have observed that earliest universe. When we create such a large project as NICA, and this is truly a world-class project with several thousand scientists and engineers from more than 25 countries involved, about a hundred leading scientific centers and manufacturing enterprises participate in its construction. All these immense intellectual and technological resources will, of course, enrich the baggage of human knowledge. Not only will they produce very important results for fundamental science, but they will undoubtedly provide the results that our society will be able to understand, applicable results. Any major project at the scale of the Nika Collider gives a tremendous push to the development of new technologies in material science, medicine, energy, industry, and computer sciences. We call it applied research at a large scientific complex. We work with thin films. This is graphene films of superconductors. We develop and create intelligent electronic systems capable of recognizing images and trajectories accurate to picoseconds and femtometers. Together with the high-tech industry, we create products that can endure pressure drops of up to 12 atmospheres. The most serious requirements, as you have already understood from the experimental conditions, are imposed on computers. We need to recognize events with great accuracy and to store and be able to process immense amounts of data in order to observe and investigate online what is happening at the point of interaction. Therefore, talking about the development of computer technologies, we are now creating a new unique computer center for NICA. We call it heterogeneous because it will use both cloud technologies, high-performance processors, and high-speed data transmission channels. And finally, there are two more very interesting things concerning the results of accelerator physics and technology development. People invented a unique instrument, accelerator of charged particles. With the help of this device, we can accelerate particle beams and use them as a scalpel that penetrates to a certain depth and with a high degree of localization, up to fractions of a millimeter, can remove ill cells in the human body without damaging the surrounding healthy tissues. As you know, in outer space, both the astronaut and the spacecraft are exposed to the effects of cosmic radiation. Cosmic radiation is a spectrum of different types of particles, 
including heavy ions in a wide range of energies. Cosmic rays of high energies and charged particles can cause failures in electronic components of a spacecraft, processors that control its movement. In addition, they have a harmful effect on the living things aboard. It can be manifested in disorders of the human sensory organs and higher nervous activity. Therefore, when we talk about long expeditions to Mars or Venus that last for three or four years, we must be sure that both the spacecraft and the astronaut will successfully fulfill their mission return to the Earth with new information about these planets. While astronauts are in space, the radiation load is accumulated during all these long years of expeditions. Here on the Earth, by using beams of charged heavy ions from the accelerator, we can, literally within a few seconds or minutes, simulate the effects of cosmic radiation on living organisms and electronics, and thereby offer new methods of protection, new materials for the spacecraft's skin, new pharmaceutics that would allow us to very quickly regenerate the failures in the astronaut's body caused by cosmic radiation. All these studies related to radiation medicine, space, new materials, new types of electronics, all this will be made here at the Nika Collider. Over the past 30 years, no experimental complexes of such a large scale have been constructed in Russia. In four or five years' time, this collider will start its operation. You are very welcome at our facility. You have a unique chance to contribute to this project using your own brain and hands to take part in the bright physics experiments that will tremendously enrich the treasury of knowledge of the entire humanity. And you can be a part of these discoveries. We invite you to Dubna. Modern Dubna is a place of a rapid scientific growth on the map of Russia. It is a magnet that attracts the world's leading scientists and talented young people. We hope that when entering university, you will choose physics, mathematics, biology, medicine, or computer science. All these areas are developing very fast in Dubna. We are happy to say that we are waiting for you and so do new discoveries at Nika.